What's up, everyone? Welcome to episode 108 of the Rudest Wrestling Podcast, brought to you by us. Matt, I know we want to talk about the Las Vegas Invitational, but you know what I'm bringing up first today. At least I hope you know me well enough. It came out this morning. Rush, yes. Russia's banned from 2020. And not that I don't want to see their best guys compete. I love watching the wrestlers wrestle, but it's so obvious to everybody. They are so adamantly cheating. They love cheating. And finally, they're getting a punishment for it. It feels good. Four years. Four years. That's crazy. So does that mean, let me ask you this, because it didn't detail this. So obviously, that's the Olympics and then the Winter Olympics. Does this mean they're also banned from like Olympic sports world championships, for example? Yeah, so, so they, they it came out they're banned from the uh, what is it the twenty twenty two FIFA World Championships well, that, for that's soccer? The, that's the World Cup, FIFA. right? But yes, so are the they World banned, Cup. Are they banned from like the twenty say the twenty twenty one UWW World Championships. I think it's any international any, competition, any, any world world level competition. That that would be that would be interesting. And so, but the, the thing that I found interesting about this press release, so I was happy that they finally had the cojones because if you remember before Rio, this stuff came out and it wasn't Matt. And people, a few people got mad at me because I posted about it on Twitter this morning. It's like Matt, they they didn't get caught cheating like one time or five times. It was like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times that they got caught. They got caught cheating i mean it, it was rampant, rampant over every it. sport it wasn't yeah. just a an isolated handful of issues out of one sport it was like across the, the everything throw your dartboard at any sport and they were they were cheating although that wrestling was number two track and field was number one i believe wrestling was number two um i think weightlifting was number three right uh, and obviously track and field has way more athletes so i think it's obvious that they were number one um so no. not only are they not only are they banned from participating, they're banned from hosting any competition too. Who I didn't even realize that in any yeah. sport, in any sport, in any sport. Oh God. Yeah. Okay. So, but the one thing that is is kind of questionable about this, and I, you know what, I should just pull up the article and read the exact wording. Uh, give me a second to find it. But it essentially said it allows athletes the ability to compete at the world. Were ours at the Olympic Games under a non-Russian flag? So, for example, um, they would they would be competing just o- on their own. Hold on, I'm what did like, they do the, the the last Olympics? Like under the Olympic flag, they competed under right. the Olympic banner or something like that. I can't re- remember technically how it was yeah. broken down, but basically, they can com- they competed under the Olympic flag. So, okay, so he- here's how it says: it says um, individual Russian athletes. A- untainted by the scandal will still be able to compete in competitions independently under neutral flag. It is unclear whether those who play team sports such as football will be able to play under neutral flag. Um, I think that's really interesting because how do you say who's, I mean, when, when something is as far reaching as this is, and you guys can go back a few shows. We, we discussed this maybe, I don't know, five shows ago or something. Um, but when something is far reaching as this, how do you know who is tainted and who is untainted? Isn't it just like everybody's tainted? That, that's the thing. Because it, it's somewhat an ambiguous statement, right? Yes. Untainted, that means you haven't been caught, right? Correct, yes. But they've been but, caught. Right. They've been caught. But what, what about, I guess, the argument is, or the conversation is, what if you've never what if you've never failed a test? Now well, that no, doesn't no, mean no, that, okay, that, okay, that doesn't mean on. that you haven't taken PEDs. You just haven't been caught. Well, no, Matt, don't you remember when when initially all this stuff came out, what what the issue was was all of these athletes, there's all these tr- drug tests which were actually um positive, which were failed tests, but and I don't remember exactly the mechanics of how they did it, but somehow Rusada, which is the Russian anti-doping agency, finagled them so that they were that they were passing tests you know they were putting like old piss samples in there or something to that effect so you know i don't know that they can tie these negative positive tests to the um you know specific athletes i don't know if that's the way they're going to do it or how they're going to do it but yeah there were a lot of athletes who were failing tests but we're not coming up as failed because somehow Rusada was finagling the system to make them pass and allow them. To yeah, pass. they were they were manip- manipulating the results, and th- and this is what's troublesome for the athletes. If there is clean athletes out of Russia, this is the problem here because they've set a precedent that they have skewed the results to make them look like they 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 didn't fail a test. So where does that where does it stop? Where do you say well? 
how many how many tests were 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 tainted? How it many was, results uh, were manipulated I'll, and I'll submitted to you? Sada? I'll find this for you. Let me see. Um, fail. Because it almost indicts all the athletes by Rusada manipulating results and giving false false data back to Usada and Wada. It then it kind of tates the results for all the athletes, well, doesn't it? Matt, it was like, okay, listen, I, I, I need to go find this for you. Um, I'm only finding, I'm, I'm Googling, I'm only finding 20, 2019 articles, but it was like 2016 or 15. Matt, it was like 200 tests in wrestling. 200 tests. Think about it, Matt. There's, if you go men's, women's, men's, women's, and Greco, there's 30 senior level athletes at the world championships. 200 failed tests? Do the effing math on that. <laughs> I mean, seriously. And this is the thing for for some people that want to give uh, a conditional yeah. pass to some Russian athletes. We've talked about this before. You really need to watch Icarus if you if you don't yeah. understand the length and the scope of you know how involved the Russian government was. Like you really have to watch it to to get to form your opinion. Whether after watching Icarus. I think then you have a more informed opinion to make a statement or have an opinion. But if you have, if you've got a feeling based upon what's coming out this morning and you haven't watched that documentary, you should really go back and watch it because yes. it really takes you beyond the curtain of what's going on. Yeah, and it totally you know, pulls back the curtain. Damn it. I can't find this test, man. I'm trying to find these, uh, all these failed tests. I'm, it's, it's a really old article, so I'm struggling to find it. If I somehow can find it uh, by the time they end of the show, I, I will bring it up. Hey, oh, listen, I meant to also bring something up. I, at the end of our show last week, I said, I'm going to text Spencer to see if he wins the Hodge. Remember I was talking about my Hodge stuff? Right. And he said, he said, he, he said he thought it kind of got into his head too much last year and he was too obsessed with it, so he took it off his list. Um, and he's only worried about going out and competing as hard as he can and as best as he can every single match, which, well, that, that's a healthy mindset. And I guess if he's if he's able to achieve that that goal, if he's able to achieve competing his best uh, to his fullest potential every single match, I think the chances are uh, fairly good that he wins the Hodge Trophy. Yeah, well, I mean, it's good clarification to know. And it probably frees him up, right? It, he just – it keeps him – gives him a good focus. Yep. To, to attack the year. He knows what his goal is. He knows what's most important. So obviously winning for you, we've talked about it for you, winning the Hodge was important to you. Yes. I don't, I'm not saying it's not important, important to Spencer Lee, but on his priority of things, obviously he feels like, Hey, I don't need that distraction. I don't need that added pressure. People are all, already going to discuss it. So, yeah. and it's out of his, out of his control to a certain extent, it's in his control his performance is in his control, and he's yep. saying, I want to focus on my performance and let the cards fall where they may. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I agree totally. So that, that's good for him. Um, I think, you know, he looks like he's in a really good place. So I don't think he definitely could. And you saw where his main, main rival was last weekend, right? He is down in Puerto Rico. He won the Puerto Rican trials. So yeah. um, I guess that means Sebastian Rivera is going to represent Puerto Rico at the Pan Ams to try to qualify for the Olympics. Yeah, that's uh, I, w I was talking to uh, Storniolo last week, and he said, because we, we were actually making singlets for Rivera to compete down in okay. Puerto Rico. And when we were going through the process, making sure the singlets are compliant, UWW compliant, he's like, it's not just about – the Puerto Rican nationals, he's like, he's going to follow this up in a couple of weeks and, and try and qualify the weight for Puerto Rico as well. Well, when is the, when is the, um, the Pan Ams? Isn't it really, um, I thought it was really close to NCA time. It actually is. Let me, yeah, look how up. are they going to do that? Uh, let's see. Pan Am is wrestling 2020. Okay. Pan Am championship wrestling 2020. Let's see. In March 6th through 9th in Ottawa. Matt, isn't that when Big Tens are? Unless it is. Well, unless he he's Well, unless he's trying to, to qualify, do a different tournament. Well, the only other one is the last chance. Yeah. Can I don't know. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me get a clarification. Let me reach out to Storniola Matt, right now. I'm a, are you going to text him right now? Because I was going to text him. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll text him right now. Okay. You can keep talking. Okay, so I'm gonna well, let me. I'm just confirm that I'm right on the dates. Big Ten Wrestling Championships 2020, because uh, it feels like that's the exact same date. I know they're in Rutgers this year. 
Oh, hail. Uh, it is in Rutgers on March 7th and 8th. That's the same, the same exact date. So he can't, he can't go to the Pan Ams. Oh, my gosh. Sebastian, are you only going to wrestle in the last chance qualifier? Why didn't he use an Olympic redshirt this year? I don't know. Weird. I guess maybe maybe he didn't meet because the it's qual- looking like I, I mean, actually, this- maybe he didn't meet the qualification criteria, Matt. No, this is interesting, and I, I we'll probably get into this, but his backup at Northwestern, Michael D'Agostino, actually got he third. Looked good at qual- looked really really good. Yeah, he looked really um, good. So I'm sure that's. It'll be interesting that how that changes well, that, the conversation yeah, with that, Northwestern. That was leading to speculation that Sebastian Rivera, as good as Diagostino was, because I mean he he legit could be a, a top ten ish guy this week uh, in the rankings if Sebastian Rivera would then just stay up at 133 pounds, because it makes a lot more sense for Northwestern to do that. And obviously, you know when you but does it really? Does it really? Because even um, even though we've got a good result at 125 from yeah. from Diagostino. We have a proven competitor in Sebastian uh, Rivera man, who like, could potentially win it. I feel like Sebastian so, Rivera is top three at one twenty five or one thirty three. I, I think it's fair. I mean, who Camp Secor is the number eight guy at one thirty three, and uh, and Seabass kind of beat him up a little bit. He majored him, correct? Ma- yeah, I thought he majored him. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. So you know, I think Sebastian's a proven top top flight guy. Whether you're twenty five or thirty three, maybe thirty three has a few more tough competitors, but. I would be picking Sebastian 25 or 33, top, top three, for sure. Yeah, I wouldn't disagree with that, but it, I guess it comes back to the athlete, right? Where he feels he can win the title, because that's that's what it's about at this point yeah, for you're Rivera. Right. You're right. You know, the next couple of years is about winning a title. It's yeah. not about getting on the podium. He's done that. Um, and he came so close, beating beating Spencer Lee twice last year. Um so you get, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how things play out because uh, I'm interested to see if Stoney will text you back by the end of the show. Let's go, yeah, Matt. Because ty- up, typically, not you, Matt, the other Matt. Yeah, <laughs> he's on the. Clock. He's actually okay. This is this is coming from Storniolo right now. Oh, we got we got live time text updates. Go okay. Go so ahead. two 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 pieces of information that we just talked about. One, he is going to the last chance qualifier in Bulgaria, which is to qualify. Uh, that's two weeks after the NCAAs, I believe, or three weeks. And most likely, he'll stay up at one thirty-three. Whoa! Breaking news! Wow, that's crazy. Uh, so maybe. Well, you know what? That's kind of Matt. He just made one hundred twenty-five pounds. For 157 kg, so it's not like he's too big uh, for that weight class, and then he'll have to make it right after for the um, for the the qualifier. Yeah. So why I I, I guess I would have I mean maybe because he doesn't he doesn't want to make it a whole bunch of times maybe that's why. Yeah, man, I, that's kind of what I thought leading up to his his competition in Puerto Rico this weekend that he was trying to keep his weight up as opposed to making scratch down at 125 three or four times before the Puerto Rican Nationals. I thought maybe that was the reason why he was on yeah. his descent plan down, um, just to stay bigger, feeling good, feeling healthy, being able to focus on his training. But um, yeah, it didn't – yeah. It didn't appear uh, appear to affect him at all. Now I don't know what the level of competition down there was for him. I could venture to say, but not not um, very good. I'm guessing. Yeah. Did Franklin Gomez win the Puerto Rican trials? You know, I don't even know. I need to look into that. They they have a a different depending on where you were and how many times you've been on the team. I I think they have discretion about who they would name to the team, which okay. I would think Franklin would and Jaime Espinal would yeah. um, at 86 kg. Um, sure. Man, I've I- actually got, yeah, I've actually was trying to reach out to Gomez last night about a, another topic. So I'll try and find out, find all that information out for us. I cannot find this last chance qualifier. I've, go- I've clicked on like four sites now. Hold on. Let me, let me see. Okay. Here I'm at. I got it. Yeah, so the last chance is April 30th through May 3. So I guess you got you got about five weeks after NCAAs for that in Sofia, Bulgaria, for your last chance qualifier. Yeah. Nice. So will these Russian athletes be stripped of because that could open up some more spots, right? If all of these Russian athletes are stripped of their qualification process because of the drug test. Cause I think I think they've qualified all six weights in men's freestyle. Two, three, 
for. Yeah, I mean, pretty much, Ben, they pretty much qualified every weight at the World Championship. Oh, no, regardless. not heavyweight, not heavyweight. <laughs> okay. Not heavyweight. But when, when you're talking about Greco and women's, I no. think they, for the, the lion's share of the qualification, they, they did that at the World Championship. So yeah. they, there's probably, what, three across the board, three or four across the board uh, spread out from freestyle Greco and women's that they haven't qualified for? Uh, I mean, in in men's freestyle, it was just heavyweight. Uh, I can't I can't speak for the other ones, but yeah, you're. I mean, yeah, they they probably qualified almost all of them. Um, well, that'll be interesting to see how that plays out. That'll be interesting to see. So that, that that was great breaking news we have on our podcast. Sebastian Rivera staying up at 133 pounds, uh, likely not guaranteed, likely. Uh, that will make you know what that'll make middles more fun because we have Seth Gross, DeSanto, and Sebastian Rivera 133 pounds. Um, that will make for some really good matches. So maybe I, I would anticipate with the quality of weight class at the Midlands that you just laid out, that's probably, they're, they're, I bet what they do is is focus Sebastian's training at 133. Like, hey, let's commit to 133 for the Midlands. Like, yep. let's not even think about 125 right now. Let's see where we're at. Let's take 25 off the, off the table altogether, say we're going all in at 133. Yep. And based upon his performance, it would give him enough time to do his descent plan and get down to 125. So I, I, I bet they're probably just taking a wait and see approach um, to Midlands and yeah. based upon his performance there. Makes sense. We'll, we'll see. Makes sense. Makes perfect sense. Um, okay. So let's, uh, let's get into Vegas. Um, I guess maybe we could just, um, yeah, we could just say uh, go wherever we want, and then ev eventually we'll circle back and cover all the weights. Um, I guess m my number one takeaway of all, all the things is Zahid Valencia. Uh, you know, he was a, a few spots lower on my Hodge list. My next one I make, um, I'm going to bump him up. He, he put a whole bunch of points on the board. He had the toughest bracket by far. And when you look at this bracket, Matt, here's what, here's what I look at it and say. I say... If this, if I look at the, say the quarters, semis, and finals, this could be an NCAA bracket. Like this could what? be his NCAA quarters, NCAA semis, NCAA finals, and he bonuses his way through it. And that's freaking really impressive. Yeah, I mean, he definitely made a statement, and I know we're, we're talking about a guy who's a two-time NCAA champ, but you know, he did have a tight match there with, with Benz early in the year, which yep. opened up the door for discussion. Is he a full size? Is he going to have trouble with these more physical? Um, guys sure. at 184. I mean, he just wiped the slate clean of any discussion about who is the favorite at 184. It's it's almost can anybody even compete with him after this weekend? Yeah, and so the because he 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 definitely was going out to make a statement, especially but in yeah. the finals. You could see he was like showing uh, Zeke in the corner one more, one more. He's like, I want I want to put the nail in the coffin. I want to yeah. major this guy in the finals. I want to major Hidley just to send a message to the entire. He yeah. sent a message to the entire country Not, in the arena because yeah. the best guys were in the arena. Yeah, absolutely. So the other, the only two in the top ten who weren't at this tournament were number were number six Nelson Brands, who's going to be bumped out because he just lost to uh, Travis Stefanik. I think he lost to. Yep. So he'll be bumped out of the top ten. And then Shakur Rashid is, uh, I think that's a, a, a later discussion. I mean, we can go on that discussion right now, Matt. But. Uh, Penn State brought damn Aaron Brooks out of red shirt, so that leads me to say, well, Shakur Rashid is either decided he's not coming back to school or they're going to kick Canell out of the lap and they're going to put Shakur up there. I, and I don't know which right. one it is, obviously, but it's, it's you don't bring you don't bring Aaron Brooks out of red shirt with Shakur coming back at 84 in a couple weeks. No, it's one or the other. Either he's not healthy to compete this year or he's going up to 197. And But regardless, he's not going to, but we're not going to see him at 184. No. So essentially with Brands getting beat, Rashid either out of the lineup or bumping up to 97, he just, for all intents and purposes, Valencia won the NCAA tournament, the projected tournament in March this weekend, or the, the his main competition he handled with ease and ran ran through the tournament, which sets up you know that looks like not the end of the discussion. Things yeah. can things can uh, can change happen, can change. He keeps looking that good that he's gonna blow everyone out of the water. Um, so, okay, so the other thing I was thinking with Zahid, Matt, is I was thinking this after, so I watched the Hidley Luhan semi, and I thought Luhan could give uh, Trey Hidley a few more, few more problems. Trey Hidley went through, think about this, 
he went through um, Taylor Luhan, Lou Dupred, and Ben Darmstadt, and he didn't give up a takedown. That's crazy. Like that's that's essentially, uh, in my opinion, like you could call them three four five. You could call them three four six. I don't know. You probably you're probably saying Luhan Dupres. You know, maybe three five six. I, you're, you, they're all ranked really really high. Is that fair? And those are all going to be the guys. They're, they're going to play somewhere one two eight. I mean, it's style styles. You never know what happens at the NSA tournament yeah. once you get beat. But these are the guys. These are the cast of characters that we have to talk about for the for the next four months in this weight class. And he ran through them every every one except for Valencia. He's looked pretty pretty. Yeah. Beyond solid. Beyond solid. Yeah. And, and the knock on, and we've heard the knock on Trey Hidley is that, you know, he he's not super dynamic. He only has a few choices offensively. And what I would argue back to that is, you know, especially, and I'm watching it again this weekend. So we'll take Zahid out of the picture. I think Zahid's shown he's on a different level than everyone else in this weight class. But Trey Hidley's positioning is so good that these guys are really, really, really struggling to get him even out of position in order to, I mean, those guys didn't come all that close to getting it. Not only did they not get a takedown, it's not like they were all that close and Hilly had to get some crazy scramble and get out of it. They didn't get that close to a takedown. No, and that's, I mean, that's not the surprising thing, but given his age, being a redshirt freshman, like how disciplined he is mm. in all areas. And people may say, well, he's not that dynamic. Well, it's it's the, you know, the old adage if you can't get taken down, you can't get beat. If you don't get taken down, you can't get beat, right? And yeah, absolutely. And typically, when he does create opportunities, he converts them at a very high high rate. Yeah. So absolutely, he do, he holds position very good, and when he does choose to score or go after a score, he usually converts. That's a pretty good strategy. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I'm so impressed by when when he goes to. It, 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 well, it's it's so it's kind of what we was talking about. There, how smart he is with position, but when he goes to his. Boom, underhook, throw by. It's kind of a knee pick-ish. Uh, his, main, his main attack there. Um, he either totally doesn't get it or blows right through them. I mean, he very, very rarely finds himself in in any kind of bad position or any kind of scramble. It's just like a really um, simple, basic, and very secure takedown that he's going to over and over and over again. Yeah, typically the odds are in, in his favor. He doesn't, to your point, he doesn't get in many 50-50 positions. If he engages in activity, the odds are typically in his favor. Hey, man, and, can I ask you a technique question? Sure. I don't know if you answer this for me or not. Okay, here's what I'm thinking. I'm going to have to back up just a tiny bit so you can see me. Um, okay, because this takedown is becoming more popular, and I don't fully get it. Like, it's not – I'm trying to figure out the dynamics and the weight balance and everything. So they're going underhook on one side, and then they're going like a knee pick on the other – knee, calf, ankle pick on the other side, okay? And – Hidley is probably the best at this, but I see a fair amount of people doing this right now. What I, I mean, it, they're not getting, they're not creating any angle. So, right, a knee pick usually, in my opinion, I think a knee pick usually you're kind of more on the angle and then you pick the knee and take him down. This one, they're pulling and they're going all the way st like straight through the guy. So my question is, you have an underhook, so it's not like you can really drive too much because I feel like you would slide down the body and you end up like in a double leg. How are they getting so much force to go all the way through someone? Because when you watch, like I said, Trey Hedley is probably one of the best guys to do this now. He goes like, he can sends the guy flying. Like he goes, boom, boom. And the guy like flies backwards. How is that? Yeah, happening? I need, I need to look into this, but I think it's, it's what they're doing with their back leg. Typically, if you're, if you're penetrating across the guy's body, yeah. right. Okay. You're just, you're driving and you're reaching and you're, you're penetrating with your lead leg. Say if I've got a left hand under hook, yeah. I'm penetrating across his body with my right knee. I think as they're coming straight in, they're bringing their tray leg up so their hips are tighter into their opponent's body mm. as opposed to cross body where they're going across yeah. the body because they're totally think, extended. Like, I, well, yeah, they're totally extended and they're kind of off balance. If the, if the defensive guy knows what they're doing, they're also kind of off balance in, in a certain way, right? You know, when right. you're reaching. And that's why I usually tell kids um, – if, if I'm an underhook, and this is, you know, again, I'm obviously off on this technique because I, I always say, like, we can talk semantics. And that's why I, I hate ideologues because they talk ideas. And it's like, okay, I can have all the ideas I want, but if Trent Hitler is going to do this to people, it, it's effing working. And I got nothing to say about it. It just works. So I typically teach people, if we're an underhook, don't go down to the ankle because then, to your point, you get too stretched out, right? Only go to the knee because then you're a little more compact because the more stretched out we get, the more likely we are to get turned or tipped or, or whatever it is, you know, especially when you're talking, you know, kids who aren't aren't on that level. So I, I've been really impressed and I see 
quite a few people using this technique. I also see like a lot of the Russians are using a similar technique. Um, and so I guess, I guess I just need, I need to dig into it. I need to find out more because I would feel my initial feeling. If someone who is not good at wrestling told me this is a great technique, I'd say, eh, I don't really think so. Cause even if, even if you're coming straight on off the underhook, yes. if you're track attacking straight on, you know what we need right now, Matt? We need a telestrator. I wish you and I we do need a telestrator, but and drawing on the screen and stuff. But you know what I'm saying? Even if you attack straight on and you stay attached to the underhook, yeah. if you hit your knee and attack at the knee or below, you're still extended and you're That's still splitting your power quite a ways. That's why I'm saying but he makes it's it when work. The, when the trail leg comes up. That's why I'm saying I got to break it down. If the yeah, trail leg comes up, too. all of a sudden your hips are in, your chest, your chest is tight with his hips and chest, and you're you're more compact, but you still gotta, not, you still got to get their weight, their ass going backwards over their heels, right? Because if you if you don't move their butt past their heels, their weight's never gonna go backwards, and they're not gonna fall. So he's also somehow he's getting their whole torso and their butt to to rock backwards over their heels. So I would say when he's attacking in with the underhook to the yeah. to the knee, it's a penetration ankle an ankle pick. Is like you're not doing anything with your body. Really, you're attacking with a hand to the yeah. ankle or the knee. Sure. But with with the straight on knee pick, it's like a penetration. You're not attacking with the arm. You're still attacking with the body to drive him back on his heels. I'm gonna, I'm about to watch this again too. I, you know what? I, I probably should have done my research, but I, I didn't think. You know, I, I thought about it when it was happening. Like when I'm watching him do it, I'm like, damn, how's he doing that again? Like, come on, man. And then there's several guys, not only his brother, but there were several yeah. guys that are really using it's, the underhook. It's yeah. almost like this technique. It's becoming a more coming, popular technique again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah it's, it's, yeah. it's really interesting. Yeah. And I, I feel like also the Russians are starting to use the underhook a lot more than we've seen it in a, the past couple of years. You know, it's it's, it's it's stuff in wrestling goes like that, right? Because it comes waves. And then obviously once if people, a lot of people start using the underhook, all the coaches are say, okay, how do we shut down the underhook? The underhook's going to get shut down for a little bit. And then, you know, you go from there, right? The other technique, and this is just a sidebar that I saw throughout the weekend. I saw more and more attempts at a a butt slide or a boot scoot. I don't know what it, whatever yeah. you call it, but yeah. I did see more and more of that. And that was more of a, I would say that was more 90s move. You're yeah. talking about Lincoln McElravey that, that brought this into, yeah, was one of the guys, there was a multiple guys that, because this is a move that I, I used when I was wrestling too, but he was one of the guys that really made it popular. Yeah, and I remember watching him do the, it for sure. The, the only other guy since that was Ian Miller a couple years ago used a and used stayed? a butt yeah used a butt slide or a boot scoot whatever you want to call it quite a bit. But he's the last guy that I can really think about that that did it yeah. with did that move with a lot of frequency for sure. Um, yeah, 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 for real. Um, okay, I feel like here's what I, Matt. I feel like today, you know, we're doing one show. And I feel like the Las Vegas invite is so big that um, I guess at some point we'll just have to stop and then do the rest tomorrow because I, I feel like we could talk about this tournament forever. All right, um, last take on 184. I'm sorry, I got two more takes on. Let's <laughs> we'll just talk about this one weight class and then we'll do that nine of them tomorrow. Um, we're so deep. I mean, we're, I yes. mean, you could just spend an episode just on this weight class and yes. the individual matchups because from the quarters through the finals and, and even and in the wrestle backs, backs which yeah. is unbelievable. I mean, looking at Ben Darmstadt getting uh, knocked well, off first well, round. I'm going to be, I'm going to tell you, I'm disappointed with Ben Darmstadt. And Matt, I, you know, he, if you remember back, what he he only had like one loss going in NCAAs his freshman year, didn't he? Or two maybe? It wasn't all. The number wasn't a lot. Not many. It wasn't many. many. So is is the weight cut affecting him? You know what what has happened um, where he he's struggling so much because now that's his. Uh, well, he lost to Deep Perez. He lost to Hidley, and now he lost twice at this tournament. So you know what is it that's affecting him so much more about this weight class? Um, then the 97 because we're only on December 9 and he and he's got four losses already, um, and obviously because it doesn't seem. It, go ahead, it, go well, ahead. It's two years away. You know, you'd think he would have made. You know, I know the kid. He's a really great kid. I thought he would have made more improvements, and so I, I'm puzzled by his str the struggling that he's doing. Okay, let's so let, let's back this up a little bit. He, he was injured last year, correct? So yeah, he was injured. Yeah, yeah, he he gray shirt or whatever it is because he was injured last year. Uh huh. So I guess the one thing that we hadn't really discussed is how much, 
How much time did he actually miss last year? How significant was his time away from the match? Is he recover? Is he still? Is he even one hundred percent? I would. I don't know. The, I don't know those questions. Um, you would think. Now you would think. I feel based like upon Rob Cole's based on Rob Cole's track record, Rob he usually Rob. doesn't send guys out unless they're a hundred percent or close to it. Yeah. and ready to go. Well, here, here's but the, he, he sent him out right right out of the yeah. gates. Well, the here's what I'm year. thinking, man. I want to say. Uh, now I don't. I'm thinking of his shoulder. I'm, I'm blanking on what the injury was, but I remember two Fargos ago. Uh, so we're talking July of July of eighteen. So now that's um, what's that? Eighteen months ago? Eight, 17 months yep. ago? Um, July of eighteen. Ben was healing up at Fargo. You know, I saw he was up there helping out coaching, and he was he was you know in a sling or he he was going through the healing process. So I mean. You know, probably worst case, he was healthy by December or January of last year. So, yeah, I feel like he's totally healthy. He's had plenty of time. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know what his struggles are. Um, but, you know, guy that I thought would have more success. And who, who knows? Obviously, he could, he could definitely still turn around. But he got pinned early by um, Owen Webster, who is a really good high school wrestler and has, has had real, a lot of um, struggles and now is starting to turn around a little bit. Um. And then he he got pinned by Taylor Venz on the backside also. Because um, this, is, this is the interesting thing too, Ben, is that when you look at a guy like Darmstadt, he has leverage strength. Yeah. He doesn't have your traditional power strength. Yep. He has leverage strength, which is seemingly would, would benefit him at both weight classes. But it yep. seems like him going down, his leverage strength has decreased as opposed to increase, because it's not like he was a huge 97 pounder. And I wouldn't even say based upon, I, even though he's what, 6'3", six, 6'4", six, I mean, he's huge. Yes. Just lengthwise, it doesn't look like he's a gigantic, outside of his height, a gigantic 184. Yes. It's not, it doesn't look like he's sucking a ton of weight to he get to. It must be. It doesn't look. <sighs> maybe, it maybe must I'm be. I'm confused. I don't know. I'm, I'm just frustrated. <laughs> But I would think I, I guess I guess for, for me looking at when he said he's going down to 184, I yeah. thought that was a good move. Yeah. I was like, it's gonna make him more dangerous. Yes, for sure. With his length. But it 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 almost seems like all his advantages have been negated to a certain extent. He seems to get more overpowered at 184 than well, he was getting so, overpowered at 197, but the, which and, is strange. At that point, Matt, then maybe maybe it's a, a movement thing, you know, because you always think the the lighter weight you go, the better kids are at moving, um, you know, and the heavier you get, the, the slower and clunkier they are, if you will. Um, and maybe that's what it is, Ben. Yeah, maybe maybe they're slightly better athletes. I, I definitely think there's there is, and again, this is calling – Athletic skill. Okay, I'm being I'm being cognizant of, of my <laughs> phrasing with you. Their la their athletic skill level is greater than at 184 than 197. I would say f for the most part. Yeah, yeah. So maybe maybe it's just that. I mean, it's just a percentage or two difference between the athletic skill level of 84 and 97. But maybe that's the tipping point. Maybe that one or two percent. When in I, the athletic realm, I, I the, yeah. the other thing here, Matt. I think you would say. I think you would say when you look at this group of one eighty four pounders, that's a, that's. I feel like it's a pretty exceptional group. Um, you know, I feel like Zahid's if Zahid's an all timer. Um, you know, Depre Hidley is going to be. I don't want to say an all timer, but he's going to be really good. Uh, Venn, well, I mean, he's looking like minimum. Yeah, if things hold true to form, four time All American. Yeah, which is that's that's great. Yeah, Luhan's been good forever. De Perez is junior world teamer, been good forever. Venz has been good forever. So you know there are quite a few really solid, and you know he's obviously ran into all of them really early in the season. So um, yeah, maybe maybe that's that's a big part of it also. Um, and the the other guy I want to bring up is weight class map because I had no idea. This guy was so good. And you know what? I actually I said someone else would be third ranked. This guy's probably number three ranked going this week. It's Hunter Bolin. He lost to Taylor Luhan on the front side. Um, and then he comes back and he beat G, uh, Max Lyon, Jelani Embry, Louis D. Prez, and Taylor Luhan. Uh, so avenge that loss to take third place. I mean, that's uh, I had no idea Hunter Bolin was this good. I was not even close to aware of that going into this season. No, and I in Honestly, I didn't get to watch him much. At a certain point, I was just focused on on the top side of the bracket. Yeah. 
I paid attention to, to the results on the bottom side. But yeah, I mean, it should be interesting, you know, how the rankings yeah. s- sort out. But I don't even know at this point, Ben. His, his, with, front, his front side match with uh, Taylor Lujan, it was an awesome match. I mean, it was just really good, good, re- great back and forth wrestling. Yeah, and at this point, it's looking like as far as seeds play out, you're you're probably if you want to if you want a chance to get to the finals, you you better get on the opposite side of Valencia. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, so because it seems, I mean, there doesn't seem that much difference or that there's a clear separation between number one and everybody else, but two okay. through ten, I mean, it's a it's a to- well, H- Hidley, conflict. Hidley and Bolin will wrestle at least twice more because they're both in the ACC. So you're talking um, a dual meet, you know, if, the, if they're nowhere else together, a dual meet and then the ACC championships. And obviously um, a whole bunch of these guys, uh, um, well, actually, no, not that many are in the Big Ten because uh, Binghamton, Cornell, where's, what conference is Binghamton in, Matt? They're in the EIWA. Oh, they're, so they're with Cornell. Yeah. Okay, so Duprez and Darmstadt will see each other again probably a couple more times. Um, They'll see each other. I believe they have a duel coming up in another week or two. Before the end of the school, before the end of the semester, I know they duel. And then they'll see each other at the conference championships. But yeah, this is probably the most of all the weight classes this year. Yeah, the most diverse. What? You, know, you, 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 you basically have every every conference represented here. Uh, okay, uh, this is bizarre. Wow. Yeah. I, I, just, I just went ahead and assumed that there's going to be a whole bunch of Big Ten guys. <laughs> Man, there's, we're, we're talking top 16. There's only there's only three Big Ten guys. You have uh, Taylor Venz. You have Nelson Brands, and you have probably whoever. Well, Shakur is out, so I'm gonna I'm gonna say Aaron, he's Aaron out. Nelson Postman. Brands is up in the air. I'm gonna now. say sure. I'm gonna say uh, who's ever Iowa representative and whoever Penn State representative will be top sixteen. So you only have th- three Big Ten representatives in this weight class in the top ten or in the top sixteen. That's really crazy compared to the other. It's crazy. Class. Yeah, I don't think there'd be another weight class where we could say that. No, there's there's definitely there's I'm, no way. Okay, let's go. Let's talk. Let's talk one, one, maybe two more weight classes, depending because that, that we talked that weight class for like twenty minutes at, at Vegas. Uh, I, my my vote is for one of the ones we talked about last week. One hundred fifty seven pounds, Matt. I'm gonna tell you, you got you got <laughs> me on this one. You nailed it. Uh, Deacon looks outstanding. He he kind of hammered he hammered Carr, and he and, and I'll say he he hammered Hidley in the finals. Um, his only really close match was Teamer, and I thought the ref should have called Teamer for stalling uh, a few more times. Teamer kind of took most of the second period off uh, and part of the third period off. Um, you know, it was close down there to the wire, but it was. I felt like it was just the ref just didn't um, didn't force Teamer to wrestle at all. So. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Deacon looked. I mean, if 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 this version of Deacon, but we said similar things again. This is how things can change. We were saying similar things this time last year about Deacon because yeah. he, he won the tournament in fairly dominant fashion. He looked great all through the end through January. Right? It wasn't yeah. until mid well, February that we were like, uh, something doesn't look quite right. So. Yeah. We saw this this similar version of Deacon last year throughout the year last year. I, I, he... feel, so I feel like, Matt, I don't feel like I had the same feelings because Jason Nope was always around last year. So I, I will obviously agree with you that, that Deacon looked good last year, but it was like, hey, Jason Nope's going to win. You know, I'm not, right. really, I'm not really thinking much about it. The other thing last year, um, and maybe it's played, but you remember Hayden Hidley had a few – um, you know, he kind of had some bumps in the road earlier on where his freshman hit his freshman year. He went to the NCAA championships uh, undefeated. So, you know, undefeated last year was a little bit different for him. But yeah, so um, man, Deacon just looked again against Carr. I mean, like I said, he had that questionable match against Teamer, but against Carr and um, Hidley, he just looked like such a, a dominant offensive force, you know, so strong on his takedown finishes and then really, really good on top, too. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to discredit what he did, but uh, in the sense of people were saying after the tournament, oh, he took out the top two guys in the country. I I get it that David Carr did somewhat earn a number two ranking, but I still think Deacon was overlooked a little bit. I never thought for a second that he was not one of the top two guys in the country. Carr's, Carr's the clear three then. I mean, if you, if you don't want to give Carr, no, the, for sure. If you don't want to give Carr the two, now, now obviously now you bump him back to three because it's Deacon Hindley. But Caleb Young, who is number three, just lost to uh, uh, Quincy. He Black. lost to Monday. Quincy Monday. Yeah. So obviously he's moving down. Um, then you know below that's Larry Early and Brady Berge, and um, 
you know, Bergie's only I think wrestled one match this year, and then and then you have Ken, Kendall Coleman and and, and Car B Kendall Coleman at this tournament. So yeah, so really, I would I would pretty much say one A one A is Deacon Hidley. Yes. One B is Carr, and then there's a separation between everybody else. Well, a little bit. I, yeah. Not a huge, but a bit of a separation at this point. Well, we'll, we'll see. I mean, I, I didn't think, I guess I, Caleb Young significantly overperformed my expectations of him last year. And so now my expectations were set a little higher. And now he's he's struggling. And it's like, if this would happen to Caleb Young last year, I said, eh, that's probably what I thought about Caleb Young. But because my, my expectations have went up significantly, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a little different. So, yeah. I guess. And the thing with, with David Carr, he looks absolutely phenomenal right now. He got controlled a little bit by Deacon in the semis, which is not that un- unexpected. Look good coming back, getting getting third, what yeah. he should do. Let's see what he does. Now he's he's facing, he's into the grind now. Now the grind really starts. Yes. After the first month, five weeks of the season, the grind really starts. You got to make it through Christmas, the holidays, and then you get into your conference schedule. So, I mean, Carr's got a long way to go. He's got it. Yes. This is where coaching comes into play for Carr, being a freshman, being more of a thoroughbred, right? When you look at when you look yeah, at well, David you know Carr, what? I was impressed by David Carr. I, I'll tell you, Matt, and and I have, uh, I I had mixed feelings about David Carr because I thought he would, you know, I thought he was always really dynamic, but uh, you know, you're talking about the grind uh, of the college season, and and I've had a few other people think that David Carr wasn't going to have as much college success, but I, you know, his hand fighting and his ability to push, specifically in the the Frantic match, which was, uh, you know, Jared Frantic didn't place in this tournament, but he came really close. He lost in round 12. Um, Carr and Jared Frantic lost the first round. And I couldn't believe how much David Carr was just pushing him around and dominating with the hand fighting. So I've been really, really impressed with um, the way he has improved significantly in his hand fighting. He's much more than just a slick wrestler who Correct. can just explode yeah. through Absolutely. you and, and, and blow you off your feet. I mean, he's going to get in there. I mean, he'll get his nose dirty. Yeah, right, he's going to get in there and he'll battle. He's and, not. He he doesn't shy away from battling, and he's much better in top and bottom in parterre than you would think he would be too. He's pretty. Yeah, he's, he's decent he's on top. Good. I wouldn't say he's. I wouldn't say he's great okay, yet, we'll but go, he's good. He's good at top and good on bottom six as out, well. Six out of ten, seven out of ten. Yeah, I'd say he's pretty good on bottom. Um, I, I I I go with you. He's not like great. Not not a leader or anything. Hey, you know who I got to sit by? Uh, so I was at the Cougar Clash, which I'm sure we'll talk about tomorrow. Um. I got to sit by uh, old Oklahoma coach Jack Spates, and I couldn't believe how much into wrestling he still was. I mean, he knew everybody. I was, uh, I, you know, I had my phone out. We were watching the, I think, so we were watching the Cougar Clash. We were also watching the semis of uh, the Las Vegas Invitational. You know, me and him were sitting there watching some matches. He he knew everybody. I was shocked. I'm like, you know, what? I, I figured once you got out of college coaching, it's like, eh. You know, I'll, I'll watch the big ones, but no, he knew he like he knew everybody. Like, oh, oh hey, oh, let's watch this match. Oh, I'm like, no, nah, man, I want to watch. No, I want to watch Demas or, you know, he he was picking other people for me. Okay, you want to hear a funny? No, I think I think it's because I mean, Jeremy, his son Jeremy, who's doing a great job at SIU Edwardsville. Yep. Like he's more of a, in a mid tier. So who Jeremy's competing sure, yeah. against and who his guys are competing against. Obviously his dad's really passionate about what Jeremy's doing. So he's evaluating, he's looking at all the guys that, that Jeremy has to compete against. So he, he has to know everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, I guess I didn't really look at it that way, but that, I think that's fair. Um, do you want to hear a funny story that he told me? Yeah. This, yeah. this is good. This is good. So we were talking about, and I'm not, I'm not going to say any names, but we're talking about people cheating at the, at the NCAA level. And he says, he's, you know, he was saying, Ben, I agree that you should always turn them in. Said, but you know what you need to do first? He said, you, you, you always need to call someone and accuse them man to man first. And that, that's, that's fair. I can agree with that. Um, he said, let me tell you a funny story about that. He said, so we were recruiting this guy. I, I don't even remember the name. He said, this kid, this kid was good and we really wanted him. But he said, he said Ben, we, we didn't have any money for him. I said okay, and so this kid tells us the story. He said, "Yeah, I was just out of Oklahoma, uh, so not Oklahoma State. I was at Oregon State, and they offered me a full ride to Oregon State." And he said, "He said okay." He said, "Well, you know, they had me. They brought me in. They made me re- wrestle a match against Oscar Wood, and they were really <laughs> impressed. They were really impressed by how I did against Oscar Wood because he was an All American at the time or whatever, and that was why they offered me the full scholarship." And so Jack says, okay. So he sent the kid home. And on Sunday, he's like, I'm bothered by this because obviously making a kid wrestle a match is, you know, 
by you know an NCAA violation. It's a tryout. It's a, it's a tryout. It's a, it's a tryout, right? So he goes, "What's well, it? It's an NCAA violation." So he says, "Well, you know, I, I'm I'm pissed about this because I want to get this kid and offer him a full ride." And so he said, "So I got it. So I'm going to call. I'm going to turn ja- Joe Wells in." So he says, "Like I called Joe Wells to turn him in." I said, "Joe, I just want to let you know I'm going to turn you in because this kid told me that he wrestled a match against Oscar Wood, <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> Joe Wells says, "Jack." I'm going to tell you this. He never wrestled the match against Oscar Wood. And here's why. Because I never brought him on a visit to Oregon State. <laughs> I thought that was good because that was like, yeah, you got me. You got you got to call people and, and confront them face to face first because you don't know what, kind, what bullshit some kid's telling you. And you do. I mean, there's so much rumor and innuendo. I mean, this gets into the RTC discussion. Like, this program's doing this. This this person's paying for this through the RTC. And hey, you know what, guys? Get beyond the rumor and innuendo. Just pick up the phone like, like men. Call each other up. Call each other up. Yeah. I thought that was a hilarious story. <laughs> he never wrestled in a match against Oscar because <laughs> we never brought him on a visit. Oh, That's hilarious. I'm That's like, hilarious. I'm like, I said, Jack, so you stopped recruiting that kid, right? And he's like, yep. <laughs> 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 Can't recruit a liar. That's for sure. Oh, um, man. Oh, it's man. Great. I feel as though we might have to have three shows this week because we only talked about two weight classes and we got to the Russia thing. We have a whole bunch of Vegas invites to talk about tomorrow. We have Iowa. We got Penn State. We got Cougar Clash. No, man, we're, we're going to be busy. We're going to be busy. We got the, I mean, the, the start of high school seasons opening up. The Ironman oh. is, is happening next this week, weekend. Next week. Yeah, yeah. Next week. But it has, it has, not right, but it, it has not happened. But it's happening this weekend. So right. this is upcoming. I don't. I don't think we'll get into a preview or anything like that. But we we might touch that on that in the next couple of episodes. Obviously, one of the top three, four tournaments in the entire country yep. to start the season with. I, so I it's agree. it always this in in some ways the Ironman determines the high school championship, the sure, national yeah. team championship. You know, if you look back, you know the winner of the Ironman traditionally has also been the high school national champ the unofficial high school champ yes you know a whole bunch for a of number years. of years yeah i agree um okay well that's it for us today matt we'll be back uh who knows we might even get tied in three shows you never, you never know uh how it's going to turn out so you, you have a good day and we'll talk soon all right we'll see you ben